CRIEnglish.com, connecting China with the world. What led up to the visit, of course, was tension between the Soviet Union and China. And there was genuine concern in China that the Soviet Union, which had beefed up a lot of its units on the border, were, 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 might, might even attack. And um, I think that was what, sig what started the, the Chinese from signaling, ch started the Chinese signaling to us that they wanted uh, to get together. And of course they knew, having read Nixon's articles in the uh, article in, in Foreign Affairs and so forth, that he was amenable to some, developing some kind of a relationship. Well, I had, you know, been a Chinese language officer and I had served in Hong Kong as an analyst and then I'd gone to work in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research doing more anal analysis on China. <clears throat> and I had actually asked for an assignment that would take me out of the China field and give me a broader look at State Department operations, U.S. diplomacy, and so on and so forth. And in fact, I was sort of burnt out on China in 1970-71. And they said, well, yes, you, you can go and work for the Secretary of State in the Secretary of State's office, which is a big bureaucratic paper mill that makes sure that the Secretary is properly briefed and properly staffed for his trips and so forth. And so I, I was doing that. I had no responsibilities for China. But as luck would have it, um, when it came time to staff the president's visit, and the secretary always went with the president wherever he went abroad, uh, the secretary asked if there was anybody in his operational, um, in his operational uh, organization who knew anything about China. And they said, well, it just so happens that we have a person who spent, you know, 10 years on it. And so he interviewed me to, to, and, and, and satisfied himself that I was suitable and would not embarrass him or whatever. And um, so he said, well, why don't you come along on this trip as my, as my in effect, private secretary? Um, the visit was structured in such a way that you had a telegenic event in the evening and in the morning, um, which would then be beamed directly back to the United States in, in prime time. Whether you were having breakfast or dinner and so forth, you'd see something interesting and, and picturesque. You'd see the opening banquet. You'd see the visit to the Great Wall and the Ming tombs. You'd see Mrs. Nixon at a commune. You'd see uh, these kinds of things. Um, and the middle of the day was reserved for actual work. And the actual work was done by, by, three, by, by, by three different de you know, divisions of the delegations. First was you know, Nixon and, and Joe and Lai, who were talking about the world, global politics. Um, getting to know each other, finding out about each other's views on, on, uh, uh, on, on the way the world worked and the way China and the United States fitted into it. Um, then there was a subdivision of the delegation led by um, Henry Kissinger and by uh, Vice Foreign Minister Chiao Guanghua who were actually talking about the, the wording of the Shanghai communique and negotiating, putting together the final touches of the Shanghai communique. And the third uh, portion was the one that I was attached to, which was the Secretary of State, uh, William Rogers, talking to, uh, to Foreign Minister Ji Peng Fei about really the practical follow-up issues. How, how do you, what, what do we do next? Um, how do we deal with issues like uh, 
like visiting visas, like fingerprinting, like um, like legal um, frozen assets, like cultural exchange, educational exchange, um, like the beginnings of major trade, trade opportunities, investment opportunities. These are what we called, or what, what were known as the nuts and bolts issues. The Chinese complained about having to be fingerprinted whenever they went to the United States. And um, our people were not clear on what the rules were. And um, some thought that it, the, these had been, um, this was no longer a requirement. Um, and um, so Secretary Rogers looked at me and he said, go find out. And so I went, um, you know, the, the, the miracle of presidential travel is that there's always a White House telephone nearby. Doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in the Emperor's Palace in Japan or whether you're in the Great Hall of the People, there's a White House phone nearby. So I went out of the meeting room and I said, where's the White House phone? Uh, and behind a pillar in the Great Hall of the People, uh, was a phone on a little table and it had a picture of the White House on it. So I picked it up and it went click uh, White House switch and I said get me the State Department Operations Center. This was about three o'clock in the afternoon, i.e. three in the morning in Washington. And I said uh, when the State Department Operations Center, which is open 24 hours a day, uh, came on the line. I said, this is Nick Platt in Beijing. We have a question about fingerprinting um, requirements for the Chinese. Um, would you please wake up the Assistant Secretary for Consular Affairs and, and, and get me the answer? Um, so there was a certain amount of fluttering in the dovecoats, and, and, uh, uh, but, but within, within minutes I had I had the answer, which was in effect that the rules had been suspended. And, um, and I went back to the meeting room and I told Secretary Rogers what the result was. And I said, why don't you add that um, modern day communications uh, can really benefit our relationship. Look how fast we got these answers. I think it, it, it was a key symbolic visit um, and having Nixon, President Nixon, be on the Great Wall would, would represent that he really, you know, was there in China. Um, he, of course, he'd been made a big show of shaking hands in, with Joe and Lai and so on and so forth. This was symbolically very important. Um, to me, though, the thing that was the most important was to watch, was to see this great big uh, communications um, trailer truck parked right next to the wall with wires leading in all directions to the TV cameras and to, uh, to the reporters and so forth who thronged the wall. I mean the wall was just loaded with reporters and commentators and TV um, luminaries. Uh, the battlements of the Great Wall were not festooned with cannons, but with cameras. And uh, so they were all there. But the, the symbolism of the most modern communications gear uh, juxtaposed with the wall represented to me the, essentially the meaning of the trip, which was the beginnings of real communications with China. I sort of, I complained to Secretary Rogers that I had met Zhou Enlai, I'd met Madame Mao, I'd met Li Xianyan, who was then the Premier, um, or Vice Premier. And um, I said, but I haven't met Richard Nixon. So Rogers, who was a wonderful 
um, r relaxed gentleman, really, in many ways, um, said, well, we're going to have a meeting tomorrow night, the end of the trip, discuss what to say to the various different leaders of different Asian countries. Um, and um, so you should come to that. So he arranged it, and I went. Um, I had no real role there except to be a fly on the wall. But I went to Nixon's suite in the Jinjiang Hotel, in the, what's now Grosvenor House, on the 15th floor, and Nixon was there. Um, I, was, I was early, like all good staff officers are. And uh, he, was, he was dressed in a sort of a flowered silk dressing gown uh, over his... Uh, over his uh, pants and shirt and so forth. And in one hand he had a big cigar, and in the other hand he had a big whiskey and soda. And uh, I got a chance to look at him up close, which I found quite fascinating. He was a very extraordinary looking man. I mean, he had a huge head and he had big cheeks that hung down. I mean, I had a, I was a note, professional note taker and I went over my notes later on and I noted that it said he had three, three walnuts apiece in, in, his, in his cheeks, which gave him a, uh, which, which, which sort of puffed him out. He looked, he was, extre he had, he looked extremely, uh, he, he was an authoritative person. He looked very tired. Um, but I think he thought he'd really accomplished something. And the meeting began, and, and the people who were going to travel to the rest of Asia to explain what had happened during the week came in, and the one was Marshall Green, who was the Assistant Secretary for East Asian Affairs, and the other was John Holdridge, who had been State Department officer for many years and had been seconded to Dr. Kissinger's staff. And what happened at the meeting was, it wasn't that they gave Nixon their ideas on what they should say, which is what I'd expected, but Nixon told them exactly what to say, because he not, not only knew the issues, he also knew the people that they were going to talk to, because during the years when he was uh, out of out of office. Before he became president, he tra traveled constantly, and he developed personal relationships with all of the leaders of Asia and other countries of the world. So he <coughs> went around the horn and he said, you know, tell the Japanese prime minister this, and give him this personal message from me, and tell the Korean president this, and um, with the following personal message, etc., etc., all the way around. I was very impressed. And uh, he knew the issues very well, and he, and he knew the personalities. So when the meeting came to an end, um, Secretary Rogers introduced me to, to, to Nixon. And, uh, and Nixon thanked all of us for, you know, what, what, what little things we'd done during the trip. And then he took me to the door, and um, he said as he showed me out the door, well, from now on you China boys are going to have a lot more to do. And so I've written a book which is called China Boys, uh, taking my cue from that, from that, uh, that conversation. Well, Chairman Mao, Chairman Mao, his health was not so good. Um, he had met Nixon the first, the first day that, that we arrived. Um, Secretary Rogers was not involved, not included, which was uh, something that got a lot of press attention. Um, but it was important, it was hugely important for Mao to meet with Nixon um, as soon as possible, so as to put the imprimatur of 
of the top Chinese leader um, and the approval of the top Chinese leader on the, uh, on the trip. And of course, after that, Chinese officials all relaxed quite noticeably. Joe and I hosted a, a, an unannounced and impromptu, insofar as anything's ever impromptu in China, uh, duck dinner and um, at the Great Hall. And, and it was um, just the people who were involved in the, in the talks, the, the, subst the substantive talks, who went to this dinner. It wasn't the cast of thousands. There may have been, what, 50, 60 people at it. <clears throat> anyway, we were standing around drinking tea before the dinner. And Joe and Lai came in, and then he came up to me. And he said, I understand you speak Chinese. He was talking with his heavy um, <coughs> Zhejiang accent. And <coughs> he said, you know, I'm, I have to give a toast to President Nixon this evening. And um, I want to quote from Chairman Mao's poem, which says, in effect, you're not a real man till you've been to the Great Wall. And um, do you think that would be appropriate? Well, I was so stunned, first of all, that he bothered to approach, in effect, the junior most person in the, in the room. And two, that he <coughs> was so well briefed that he knew that person spoke some Chinese. Uh, I was I was stunned, and and of course I, I said, of course, of course, Premier Joe, it's it's uh, just the right thing to say, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 